more Bhagavate. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So we'll be reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Well, I thought we would do is we will read from the eighth canto, chapter 12, text number four. So what I'll do is I'll read the Sanskrit, then we'll go to the transliteration, translation purple, then we can we can discuss from there. Okay, so Sri Mahadev Vacha Deva Deva Jagad Vyapin Jagadisha Jagan Maya Zavishama Vibhavanam Twamatma Hir to Ishvaraha Translation Sri Madhavaha Uvacha Shiva Madhadev said Deva Deva O best demigod among the demigods Jagat Vyapin O all-pervading Lord, Jagat Isha, O Master of the Universe, Jagat Maya, O my Lord, who are transformed by your energy into this creation, Save Sham Api, all kinds of Bhavanam, situations, Twam, you, Atma, the moving force, Hetuhu, because of this, Ishvaraha, the Supreme Lord Parameshvara. Translation, Lord Mahadev said, O chief, among, o chief demigod among the demigods, O all-pervading Lord, master of the universe, by your energy you are transformed into the creation. You are the root and efficient cause of everything. You are not material. Indeed, you are the super soul or supreme living force of everything. Therefore, you are Parameshvara, the supreme controller of all controllers. Purple, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu, resides within the material world as the Sattva Guna Avatar. Lord Shiva is the Tamo Guna Avatar, and Lord Brahma is the Raja Guna Avatar. But although Lord Vishnu is among them, he is not in the same category. Lord Vishnu is Deva Deva, the chief of all the demigods. Since Lord Shiva is in this material world, the energy of the Supreme Lord Vishnu includes Lord Shiva. Lord Vishnu is therefore called Jagat Vyapi, the all-pervading Lord. Lord Shiva is sometimes called Maheshvara. And so people think that Lord Shiva is everything. But here Lord Shiva addresses Lord Vishnu as Jagadisha, Jagadisha, the master of the universe. Lord Shiva is sometimes called Vishveshvara. But here he, is, he addresses Lord Vishnu as Jagan Maya, indicating that even Vishveshvara is under Lord Vishnu's control. Lord Vishnu is the master of the spiritual world, yet he controls the material world also, as stated in Bhagavad Gita, Mayadyakshina Prakriti, Suyate Satcharacharam, okay. um, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva are also sometimes called Ishvara, but the supreme Ishvara is Lord Vishnu. Lord Krishna, uh, is the supreme Ishvara is Lord Vishnu, Lord Krishna. As stated in Brahma Samhita, Ishvara Parama Krishna, the supreme Lord is Krishna, Lord Vishnu. Everything in existence works in proper order because of Lord Vishnu. Andantarasta Paramanu, Chayantara Stam. Even Paramanu, the small atoms, work because of Lord Vishnu's presence within them. Nagyana Timiranda Sia, Gyananjana Shalakaya, Chakshu Militam Yenatas, my Sri Guru Venamaha, Sri Chaitanya Manovish Tam Stavitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadama Yam Dadati Swapadantikam. Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Patakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sagana Raghunatam Vitam Tvam Sajiva Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishikam Vitam Shahe Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chikatvate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radha Vrindavaneshwari Rishabhanu Sutadevi, Pranamami Hari Priye, Vantika Patrabhishcha, 
Pribas Hindu Vieva Chapatit Nam Pava Nebu Vaishna Vebu Namona Maha. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Sri Advaita Gadada Sri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So, it's a very interesting verse and a very interesting purple for a number of reasons, which I thought we could explore a little bit on the call today. So, Lord Mahadev said, O chief demigod amongst the demigods, O all-pervading Lord, master of the universe, by your energy you are transformed into the creation. You are the root and efficient cause of everything. You are not material. Indeed, you are the super soul or supreme living force of everything, which is interesting. Therefore, you are Parameshwara, the supreme controller of all controllers. So Mahadev, right? So we know Mahadev is the name of Lord Shiva. In fact, even the name Shiva itself means auspicious. But it's also explained that those names, the names that demigods have, they are actually names which are which are in a sense, names which are Krishna's names. So Krishna is, is actually Shiva in the sense that he is all auspicious. Maha means great, Deva means demigod or God. So Mahadev is, is, is given that sense of reverence to Lord Shiva. But the real or the ultimate or original Mahadev, the original great Lord is Krishna himself. And he's been glorified here. So in the eighth canto of the Bhagavatam, there is a pastime. <laughs> Lord Shiva um, addresses the Lord. Right? So Shiva is a demigod. He addresses the supreme personality of Godhead. And he, he, he's heard about the Lord's form, the Lord's female form, Mohini Murti. And, and he, he wants to see. I'd like to see. You know, I heard, I've heard you. You, you manifested this female form that bewildered the demons, etc. I'd like to see this form. And, um, and you know, he's asked, are you, are you sure you want to see this form? I said, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see it. Ultimately, he becomes bewildered by that form of Mohini Murti. But it's very interesting. Having been bewildered and then comes to his senses, He's actually very humble and he's very proud of the Lord. He's, he's very proud of, wow, my Lord is so powerful that he can bewilder anyone in that sense. So this verse is very, very interesting because Lord Shiva is praising Krishna. And this is really important to understand that all the demigods, they all are devotees of the supreme lord right in that sense they all know that there is a supreme i mean they how devoted they are that's another question because we see for example the king of the demigods indra he can become very bewildered he can make all kinds of mistakes in that sense so being a demigod is not the highest it's not the highest position but it's it's an elevated situation in the material sense He's glorifying the Lord. And these prayers that we read in the Bhagavatam are always very, very significant. Because in glorifying someone, you're also describing those pers that person's qualities. Okay. So, O chief demigod among the demigods, all pervading Lord, master of the universe. And it says, by your energy, you are transformed into the creation. That means that literally everything we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis is Krishna. So there is the personal form of Krishna, and then there is Krishna's energy. Just like there is the sun, there is the um, light of the sun, the effulgence of the sun, there's the heat of the sun. And they are emanations from the sun, but you can't, you can't separate them. 
in, in one sense. You can't say the sun exists, but you know, separate from the heat and light. If there's no heat and there's no light, it's not the sun. So Krishna, uh, the energetic is always with his energies. Yeah? We have the Shakti and the Shakti Man. So Krishna's energies are the, uh, the building blocks of everything. They cr he, he's created everything by his energy, but then also he's, as he said here, all-pervading Lord. He's in everything. Why is this important for us to understand? This is important for us to understand because it helps us to realize that there are no accidents. One of the most painful things that people can experience in the material world is loneliness. And what is loneliness? Loneliness is when you feel that you've been abandoned. There's no one there, no one listening to you, no one there for you, no one to hear you. And you just have to struggle and try to make it through with no support. In the modern world, because we've lost community, because we've, we've become too engrossed in the economic paradigm, so people are working all the hours God sends with the idea that I'm working for my family, for myself, but you don't spend any time with the family and you don't have any time for yourself because you're working all the time. It's a real, um, it's a really crazy situation in the modern world. And therefore, increasingly, so many of these mental illnesses, anxiety, depression, and so on, they all connect to this idea of loneliness. This idea that I'm struggling myself in this huge cosmic manifestation, and my struggle is alone. There are many people, even when they're in the crowd, they still feel as if they're alone. It's weird, even to the, in the Kali Yuga, it's more rare to find people who feel connected than to find people who feel um, disconnected, even though we have so many technologies of connection from the internet, from the mobile phone, the WhatsApp, whatever it is, people feel alone. And the first, the first real disconnection everyone has in Kali Yuga is the disconnection from their true self, a disconnection from the real identity, huh? the real identity, Jivaras Rupoi Krishna and Nithya Das, we're alienated and disconnected from our true selves. And that disconnection, it manifests in terms of the false ego. Here, it's interesting. You are transformed into the creation. So we know the creation is Krishna's energy. Then the, um, Shiva says, you are the root and efficient cause of everything. A question comes up in the life of devotees, right? Am I the doer or am I not the doer? And if you carefully read scripture, you'll see actually different answers to that same question. Prakriti kriya manani, um, prakriti kriya manani, gune kamani savasya, ahankra vimudatma kata hamiti manyate, kata aham iti manyate. So in that particular verse in the Bhagavad Gita, it's actually saying that the living entity thinks that he's a doer, he or she. Right? And at the same time, we read in scripture that in the Vedic age, if someone murdered an innocent person, his own life would be taken. Okay. Now, let's think about that. If someone murders an innocent person, his life is taken. Why is his life taken? Because he's done something wrong. So he's done something wrong and he's held responsible for it. What does that imply? It implies that he's actually the doer in that respect. You killed this, this innocent person. Therefore, the king is now going to make sure that you're killed to pay back that karma for this innocent person who you've killed. So in that sense, you'd have to say, yeah, he is actually the doer. He, he, you know, if, if someone goes into a court of law and they're accused of murder, they couldn't then turn around and say, well, um, actually, um, your, your honor, um, according to the Bhagavad Gita, according to Krishna, actually, yeah, we're not really the doer. 
So I, I don't think I should actually go to prison for this crime. It wouldn't work that way. How do we, or how does scripture reconcile the two? The reconciliation is that we are one factor of many which determine what happens in the material world. And I really wanna bring this to life for you because otherwise people think that it's a theoretical understanding. There's nothing theoretical about this understanding. When Shiva says here, you are the root and efficient cause of everything. I want to explain how this works practically. So you want to post a letter to someone, okay? So you've got a letter, you put it in the envelope, but it's not enough to put it in the envelope. You have to write the address. There has to be an address there, okay? Otherwise, it, there's no way to know where the envelope's going. The address is not enough. You have to also put some stamp. You have to pay some postage and put the stamp on the envelope, okay? Now, that's not where it ends. So you've got the letter, it's in the envelope, you've got the address, you've got the stamp, now you have to put it in the correct post box, okay? You can't put it in any, in any um, situation. You can't just post it into any box. It has to be in the official post box. If that post box is not officially recognized, then the letter that's put in the post box will not be received, will not be picked up by the postman and will not be delivered to its destination. Okay, so when we break this down, what do we see? Okay, you wrote the letter. Okay, you wrote the letter. You determined where you want it to go, right? So you're a doer in that sense. You, you wrote the letter. You have a desire for it to reach a certain destination. You've also paid a price. You're going to put a stamp, a po so paid some postage. So you've, there's also some some yagya, some, something that you've given in order for the goal to, that you want to achieve to be achieved. But now what do you do? You put the letter in the post box. You can't put the letter wherever you want. You have to put it where some higher authority has asked you to put it. When you write down the address, you have to write the address in a way that the higher authority says you have to write the address. So what is that? This idea, I've got, a, I've got a convention that I have to follow. I've got to write the address in this way. I've got to pay this much postage. I've got to put the stamps on the letter in this way. You're following certain conventions. These conventions that you follow, these are Krishna's laws, okay? Now, it goes further. You have to put it in the box that the government say. That government is symbolic of Krishna. So Krishna says, this is the process by which this is gonna work. You have to follow his process. And only after following his process properly, then there's a chance that something will happen. So the cause, the root and efficient cause means that the living entity, we, whether we are atheistic or religious, all Krishna conscious, every step of our existence is a step in life which is working under superior law. Right? Unless we work under superior laws, nothing happens. You know, so you want to pass your exam. Okay, but I'm not going to read any books. I'm not going to do any, any studying. I'm not going to attend the classes. You're not going to pass the exam, right? Someone says, I, I want to pass the exam, but I don't have to do all of that stuff. Great, great idea. But it's not going to happen because the means by which you to the means by which you will achieve your goal are not determined by you. The means by which your goal will be achieved is, is determined by a superior arrangement. So this point about Krishna being the root and efficient cause of everything, it means that he creates the system. And you only get your desire achieved if you follow his rules, his rules. Now, let's take the analogy further. You put the letter in the post box. Now, that's out of your control. The postman 
has to come and take those letters and then do something with them. So in one place, Prabhupada says, man proposes, God disposes. Very interesting word. So we're making all the arrangements, we're doing everything, but actually we're dependent upon the Supreme Lord for the outcome. This is what's explained. And this is why we're not considered the ultimate doer. Okay? Now, think about this. We, we've had experience, we've all had experience in our lives like this. You've had experience in your life where you've worked very hard for something. And the result, the outcome wasn't so, so great in magnitude. And you've had experience in life where you've seen someone not work so hard. And the results were much bigger. So they put in minimum effort and got maximum outcome, whereas someone put in a lot more effort and got a lot less results. That proves that between the input and the output, there is another factor. There is another element that really makes the decision about the, the end result. And that, that factor, that X factor is actually Krishna. So this is how we should understand that we're not the doer. We are the individual who is meant to make the endeavor. We're meant to make the endeavor according to Guru, Sadhu Shastri, but again and again, Prabhupada will say, do not be dependent or do not be attached to the outcome. Uh, and interesting here in this prayer by Lord Mahadev, he says, indeed, you are the super soul and interesting, or the or supreme living force of everything. Now, this is really important because everything in the material world has a certain quality or qualities. So, for example, fire burns, but we never ask the question, why does it burn? It's material energy, but that potency that causes the material energy to work in a certain way, that potency is coming from Krishna. And because he has unlimited potency, he arranges that different aspects of the material energy will have different effects and will work in different ways. So water is wet, right? Water can dampen something, it can soak something. Fire is hot and bright, it can burn something. Those potencies, the potency that different things have, even to the point of the potency that an individual has, that potency is a manifestation of Krishna. What does he Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita? He says, I am the ability in man. So this is a very powerful verse because if we really understand it, you can continually meditate upon Krishna on a day by day, moment by moment basis. It's so, it is such an exciting time to be Krishna conscious. Because if we understand the, what, what the scriptures are telling us, then we start to see within our lives, we start to see literally the hand of God. So we may be going through a situation and we're making a particular endeavor and things are not working a certain way. Right? They're not turning out a certain way. And there can be a reason for this. I was thinking the, um, so some, I, I remember there was a class by His Holiness to Mount Krishna Maharaj, and he said that some people criticize the first part of the Lilamrita. They don't like the first part because they say it makes Prabhupada seem too human. You see him come to the West, right? He's in America for one year, no one's listening to him, right? He says in, in it's mentioned in the Lilamrita in the first part, he would sometimes go back to the shore, uh, to, the, to the docks, thinking about going back to India. But, but Prabhupada told his devotees, his disciples later on, he said he realized later on that at that time when he was going through challenges like that, Krishna was just preparing him for what lay ahead. And this is really significant for us. In order to attain the goal of Krishna consciousness, 
we need to be determined. What is the fuel of determination? Determination is fueled by hope and faith. And what gives us that hope and that faith? It comes from many sources. One of them is the ability to understand Krishna's presence within our lives. If we are in that mood of prayer, and if we're conscious, and if we're in that mood of gratitude, that whenever something is happening, good or bad, we can actually say, thank you, Krishna. And we can try to understand the transcendental gift that is coming through whatever challenges or benedictions, so-called benedictions that we're facing. If we have that attitude, something extraordinary happens in our life. If we have that attitude, then Krishna becomes more apparent in our life. Okay, now, how does this work? In the first canto of Bhagavatam, there's a purple that says where Prabhupada talks about how um, the reason why we as humans, the, the reason why we like um, hearing our glories, you know, being praised, is because that that tendency is there in its original form in Krishna. So what happens when you appreciate someone? When you appreciate someone, they become, um, they, they feel a sense of gratitude. They also feel a certain desire to reciprocate with your appreciation. So the more that we appreciate Krishna, the more that we appreciate all the amazing blessings that he has given us, even the blessing of just knowing that he exists, that's, that changes everything. Because what the living entity is looking for is a perfect, loving experience. We're looking for a perfect, loving experience. And what does that mean? It means the ability to feel a, a, a deep sense of gratitude, love and reciprocation with a perfect person in a perfect situation at all times. So we want to encourage you. Krishna, he can be even more present in each and every one of our lives. And he can help us to understand in every situation, good, seemingly good or bad, that he's lovingly present and that there is an ultimate blessing, an ultimate um, benediction that comes through all the experiences that we go through if we have the correct consciousness and the correct mood. Which means that whenever we go through anything, good or bad, we can really turn to Krishna and say, thank you, Krishna. Thank you. Because the ultimate controller, here, the last line of the sentence, therefore you are the Parameshwara, the supreme controller of all controllers the ultimate controller, the supreme controller, the supreme controller of everything that goes on in the material creation, the supreme controller loves you. It's a really, it, it's, it's a very profound point to understand that the person who's ultimately in charge of everything actually loves me. That means that there is a benevolent purpose behind every atom, every moment of my existence in this material world, because in every atom and present at every moment is that supreme, supreme Krishna who loves us and who's in full in knowledge, in bliss, in eternity, and who is, if, if we will allow him, this is really important, to the extent that we will allow him, who is making arrangements for us to return back to our ultimate experience of deep and eternal happiness and love. Now, this is where it gets a bit interesting because it's not that everything that happens to us is Krishna's will, okay? This gets, people get confused about this. There's what Krishna wills and what Krishna allows or sanctions, okay? 
For example, Krishna doesn't will that the cows be slaughtered, right? We know that for a fact. Um, Govramani Hitacha. Jagaditaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namonaha. Namobramani Devaya Govramani Hitacha. Jagaditaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namonaha. Right? He, Govinda, he's a lover of the cows. He gives pleasure to the senses. It's not that he wants the cows to be killed, but every day on this planet, cows are being killed. So it's not his will that cows be killed, but the material world is a place of action and reaction. So there's certain things which are allowed to happen based upon choices that we ourselves have made previously. So we, so, so Krishna is like someone who creates a computer. He sets the program in the computer and he says, if you want, I can give you the manual, the manual to the computer. The manual which allows you to understand how the computer works is called Shastra. It's called the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's called the Bhagavad Gita. When you read the manual, then you answer, oh, if I press this button, then the, then the screen will turn off. If I press this button, the volume will go up. If I press this button, the volume will go down. So when I press the button for the volume to go up, and it goes up, I can't blame God. I can't say, oh, Krishna's fault. You know, the, 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 there was too much noise. It's Krishna's fault. No, no, no. He explained how it works. And then you made that choice within the selection that you had available to you. You see? So what we are experiencing in our lives is based upon certain decisions that we have made previously. Earlier in this life, and, and in many cases, in previous lives also. Um, it's interesting, at the end of the Mahabharata, um, Dhritarashtra, he asks the question, he says, why was I born blind? And my, why did my 100 sons have to die in the battle of Kurukshetra? And um, Dhritarashtra is told, he said, he was told that 50 lifetimes ago, you were a hunter and you shot a flaming arrow into a nest of birds. He was told that the parents got away, right? The parents managed to escape the nest, but the flames from the arrows seared their eyes and blinded them. And within the nest, there were 100, um, you, know, you know, other living entities. And so because the nest was destroyed, those 100 living entities in the nest, they all died. And then Dhritarashtra says, okay, I understand what you're saying. He says, but, but that was 50 lifetimes ago. So why did it, all of this happen now? And he's told, he said that it took you 50 lifetimes to come to the point of having 100 sons. So our previous behaviors, they catch up with us at different times. Now, what does devotional service do? Devotional service it minimizes those reactions. But that minimization is according to the degree of our surrender, right? So if someone is, so imagine it's raining outside and you're on one side of the road and you're, you're getting wet. Krishna's on the other side of the road and he's got an umbrella and it's a big umbrella. He says, Come and take shelter of me, and then you won't get wet. Some people will come completely under the shelter, and they, they're completely no longer getting wet. Other people, they'll come a little bit in the shelter. They'll stand just, just at the edge of the, of the umbrella. So there's still part of them is still getting wet, and part of them is under the shelter. Yeah, you, you even have some people, they'll go completely under the umbrella for a while, then they'll go back into the rain. Then they'll go back under the umbrella for a while. Then they'll go back into the rain. So it is actually according to our surrender. To that degree, we are protected from our previous karma. So people think it's either one or the other. No, it's both. For a pure devotee, though, they have no karma. They're fully surrendered. But for many of us, it's a process of becoming surrendered. It's not something that happens, something that happens just in one, in one experience. 
It's something that we work towards over time through our purification in devotional service. So to the extent that we're surrendered to that degree, we are protected. That does not mean that things will not happen to us. But what it does mean is if someone is fully surrendered, they get Krishna karma. So Krishna takes all your karma, but then he may give you something that seems like karma, but he's giving it to you specifically in such a way that can still help you ultimately to move forward on your path of devotion. Now we sometimes think, well, I don't understand. You know, I, I've had this challenge, I've had that challenge, but we should be very honest. In many cases, we don't learn so much when things are going okay for us. In many cases, we sometimes only get a certain lesson or don't, or, or sometimes only really understand a certain lesson when we go through some difficulty. Hmm? You sometimes see that people are eating in an unhealthy way and they know that you should eat in a more, you should eat a more healthy diet. You should have three meals a day. You, should, um, you shouldn't be you know, standing up when you eat. You shouldn't be running around when you're eating. And people say, yeah, 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 it's true. Yeah, 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 but, but they still do it. But then if they get an illness, suddenly they become more conscious of their health. So, so Krishna knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows that sometimes a person, even though they've been given the lesson, and we are given all the lessons through the scripture, we may not really take the lesson so seriously. And therefore, sometimes even something that was just given to us in a very soft way, right, through the pages of the scripture, here, look, this is something that you should do. This is something that Krishna says you should do. But we don't take it seriously. Yeah, 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 Krishna, yeah, Krishna says yes. Yeah, 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 of course, Krishna, yeah, yeah. But we don't take it seriously. And then, because we didn't take it seriously, something happens to us which we could have been protected from had we taken the message seriously that was on the pages. Krishna's so kind and so soft-hearted. He wants to help us. So, okay, I'll just give you the message in a very easy to access way. But we don't necessarily listen. I had a, I had a call. Well, no, I had a message from one devotee. They went through a difficulty in, in their dealing with one particular person at work. And it really hurt them. They were really hurt by, by what happened, you know, in, in their dealing with this particular person who, who they still work with, actually. And they, they sent me a message and they asked, you know, like they wanted to know about times where I've had difficulty with people and how I, how I, how I managed to process, process those emotions and come through to the other side. And one of the things I said to them, because it was interesting, when I was reflecting, I thought, how did I manage to process this? And I realized that in many cases, if I was really honest with myself, Krishna gave me an early warning. You know? You sometimes see early signs, early warnings that, okay, this person, they're a little bit like this. You know, let's say that someone is a bit of a gossip. So you're getting early warning signs. This person, they have a tendency to just gossip about people behind their back, right? Or that someone is a little bit selfish. Early warning signs, you know, you've asked them to do something. They've asked you for help. You've helped them. You've asked them to do something that they can do and they can do easily. They, they don't want to help you at all. There's, there's a tendency here. But because we don't always truly, truly pay attention, we're not conscious being conscious is a, in, a, in a deep sense is symptomatic of the mode of goodness. Because we're not conscious, we're dull. The, the, the desire to just enjoy can make a, an individual dull. Where we don't really pay attention, you know, we don't really notice what's going on. And, and it's so interesting because Krishna loves us. He will give that realization in heart, early warning. But yeah, yeah, we don't really pay attention. I, I was speaking to one devotee and they were talking about you know, really tuning into what Krishna is saying to us. And I was saying, yeah, one of the easiest ways is through the scripture. Because when you read these verses and purples, you're actually reading the voice of the Supreme Lord. The verses and the purples, they're Krishna's voice. 
They're Krishna's voice. They're the voice of those pure devotees such as Prabhupada who are perfectly aligned with Krishna. It's the same voice. So when you're reading the scriptures regularly and reflecting on it, what you're doing is you're becoming accustomed to hearing the inner voice of the super soul. And this will change everything in our life because you hear the inner voice and you get used to that inner voice. It's the same voice. What you're reading, same voice in the heart. Oh, and that will make us more conscious. Oh, you'll pick up even small things. Oh, I see. This is going on. Therefore, this is likely to be the outcome. I'm so excited about spiritual life because I see that to the extent that we take it on board and utilize what we've been given properly, take it seriously and apply it properly, to that extent, miracles are always happening. And I repeat that, to the extent that we use what we've been given properly, consciously, miracles are always happening in the life of a devotee. Yeah? Because you have here, the Parameshwara, the supreme control of all controllers, he's sitting in your heart. And he's constantly trying to communicate with us. He's constantly trying to guide us. And that same voice in the heart is present in the, in the scripture, is present as sadhu, is present as guru. And in the modern world, the whole self-help industry is all down to one thing. People are looking for guidance and coaching, but every devotee has the ultimate guide. Sitting in the heart, but we are not attuned to hearing. And that's our, that's our real, our real um, um, uh, misfortune. Prabhupada says the root cause of all suffering is ignorance. Krishna destroys all ignorance by giving that guidance within the heart, but we're not, we're not, we're not used to listening. We don't practice listening. So Prabhupada has written his books as a practice in hearing from the super soul, hearing from Krishna. And after, after, after we do this deeply and deeply and more and more again and again, we become so attuned that as a pure devotee, the pure devotee at any point, they understand what Krishna wants. And the wonderful thing is whatever Krishna wants for you is whatever will be, is the same thing that will give you unlimited and ultimate happiness and satisfaction. Okay, so we'll stop here. And um, we'll just maybe open up for any questions. Hi, Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. That was a very deep and nice class. It's always wonderful to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I request devotees, if there are any questions, comments, realization, please go ahead. Seems that there's no questions. Uh, am I saying it correct? The name is Sukhavaha Mataji. She has raised hand. Yes. Please go ahead, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare um, Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji, for such a lovely class. It was really, really interesting. And so many good points you mentioned. And the best point I got it is like when we read the shastras we can hear the inner voice that is so so good that makes me now like i should read more <laughs> more seriously um just a question uh sometimes you find yourself in the situation that you don't even get chance to think you are just like you know thrown into some some workforce like you know it's um one after the other tasks are given to you and you don't get chance to even breathe that's what we feel if if i if you can understand what i mean yes so what what is the purpose of that like why does krishna puts into that sort of a situation that we can't like no no rest for us is it something krishna is trying to tell us it, it, it could be Krishna's will, but it could also be just due to previous decisions that we ourselves have made. That's mm -hmm. one thing. And then the other thing to bear in mind is 
it sometimes we feel powerless when we aren't powerless you see mm -hmm. sometimes people feel okay i was under pressure to agree to something and actually yeah, they may have been under pressure to agree to something but then what happens is they may have still known that this is a bad idea so i'm under it's like i'll, I'll give an example like with young people so there's peer mm -hmm. pressure mm -hmm. so let's say that so let's say that someone's son or daughter is you know spending time with certain other young people and and then in that group one of you know they they, they start smoking and mm -hmm. then you can say well that son or daughter was under pressure to smoke because everyone else was smoking they were under pressure to smoke mm -hmm. but even under pressure they could have said no yes you see? so true yeah so what happens is this is this is you made a really good point because what what the the, the psychology and the structure of Krishna consciousness is very, very interesting. What Krishna tries to do through Guru Sadhu Shastra, he tries to make us qualified before the test, right? In other words, what he tries to do is he's like, okay, he knows what we're gonna have to experience. He knows, okay, so Buddha Bhavna, because of things you did in previous life or you know, many lifetimes ago, in this life, you're gonna have to experience this, you're gonna have to experience this, you're gonna have to experience this. So what he'll do, okay, you have to go through some of these things. Mm -hmm. But what I'm gonna do therefore, is I'm gonna give you the education so that when you come across these tests, mm -hmm. you'll be able to respond perfectly to the situation, even though you're under pressure. And, and we all know this, we've all seen in our lives, there's been a situation where we were under pressure to do something, mm -hmm. but we still did something else. Right, we we all seen this, we, and we probably know this with other people. We've seen mm -hmm. situations where people were under pressure to go along mm -hmm. with with one with one in in one direction, and mm -hmm. even though they were under pressure, they resisted because we still have free will, you know. Mm -hmm. Now the other thing, and this relates to your point, Ivana, is it even worth and worth to put any effort to try and make a bad material situation better? Is something is very hard to change right now? Well, it depends. So it depends on what you mean by a bad situation. So the question is, is it an issue for my process, uh, for my progress in Krishna consciousness, right? So you may be in a situation where, let's give an example. Let's say you have a job and mm -hmm. you don't think it's such a good job because the money isn't very good, the people aren't very nice, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So mm -hmm. the question now is, should I even try to change it? The question is, you can try, but the special thing is, you don't have to leave the job. You can stay in the situation while trying to improve it. And then if, an, if, an, if a new option comes up, which you can move into, then you let go of the bad and you, you take on the, the positive, you see? So many times, many times we settle for something which is not healthy. And many times we try to change something when it's not necessarily unhealthy. But the biggest thing we should change, the biggest thing we should work on all the time is our consciousness, right? Now, how do I explain this? We don't know what we've done in previous lives. We don't know what we're gonna experience in this life. The one thing that we, that we will be experiencing throughout everything that goes on in this life is our consciousness. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we know that if I transform my consciousness, it is our consciousness that literally makes heaven into hell and makes hell into heaven. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. So this is the point. This is, and, and this is your real insurance is your consciousness. Mm -hmm. If we purify our consciousness, we can even be in difficult situations and we won't be disturbed. I, I heard a class and um, there was some incident in Prabhupada's time, I, I think there was some pressure, you know, people were protesting or there was some resistance to the movement in some situation. And if I remember correctly, it was either Prabhupada got the letter or some kind of communication about something. He, he received some kind of news, which is, which is externally bad news. Mm -hmm. And what was so interesting, um, one devotee who was there at the time, they saw Prabhupada in his room. And I think Prabhupada read the letter or got the news. And it was negative news externally. But Prabhupada just started laughing. He just started laughing and laughing and laughing. 
And it was a brilliant example of the consciousness of someone who is not attached to the roller coaster of the material world. It's so painful to see how sometimes as devotees, we suffer so much more than we need to, right? Because what happens is, Krishna, so let's say you come into Krishna consciousness when you're 20. Krishna knows that when you hit the age of 24, you're gonna go through some challenging experiences externally. So mm -hmm. when you come in at the age of 20, you'll be told by the devotees, read the books, study, chant nice rounds, all of these things. And in many cases, we yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll do a little bit here and there. We don't take it too seriously. Now there's two alternate realities. There is the devotee who at the age of 20 took it very seriously. So he really tries to study. He really tries not to offend anyone. He really tries to study the books. He really tries to chant nicely. Because he took mm -hmm. it seriously, mm -hmm. when he hit the age of 24, mm -hmm and these difficulties happened, they didn't affect him so much, why? Because the difficulty is one thing, right? So let's say here, the difficulty, let's say on a scale of one to 10, let's say the difficulty was a number eight, but that devotee from the age of 20 to 24, he was very focused and serious about his spiritual life. So you had the difficulty, which was eight out of 10. Because he was serious, his spiritual strength was nine out of 10. So when someone who's on, whose strength is nine out of 10 has to carry a weight, which is eight out of 10, he can still carry it. Now let's look at an alternative situation. The devotee came in at the age of 20. He was encouraged, yeah, read properly, don't offend anyone. He didn't take it, yeah, 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 yeah. But his friends were just uh, yeah, a bit relaxed. Yeah, and so I'll be relaxed as well. He didn't take it too seriously. He didn't know what was coming. Yes. So now the same person, when he reached the age of 24 and he has the difficulty, which was always going to come because he had the karma. Your karma yes. is when you're age 24, you're going to experience something which is eight out of 10. But because he did not do, he did not take his spiritual life seriously. When he hit his karma, his spiritual strength was only five out of 10. And therefore, that karmic situation that he had to go through, it really affected him, it really damaged him. Mm -hmm. And then what, does it, what happens in that case? For many devotees, the first thing that we'll think is, why did Krishna do this to me? I, I'm such a sincere devotee, why, why did Krishna do? But no, no, no hold on. It, it's, not, it's not the situation, it's how strong you are in relation to what you're going through. You see, it's, it's, it's just like, I'll give an even better example. This pandemic mm -hmm. that the whole world has been through. There are mm -hmm. some people when they went through the pandemic, it was bad, but you know what? Throughout all these years, they've been exercising properly, eating healthy diet, you know, they've been saving. So they have strong physical immunity. They had good relationships, so strong support system in the community. They've been saving their money. So if they lose their job or the, you know, the, the business goes down, they can fall back on some savings. So it's the same pandemic that everyone is experiencing. But because they prepared beforehand, they had some capacity, some resources, some strength was built up. Then when they reached this unusual and unexpected situation, they've got some capacity to draw on. But you have someone else, you know, every day, just spending my money, don't care, you know, I eat whatever I want, I eat junk food, I don't exercise, you know, I, who cares, you know, I just enjoy myself. And then when the pandemic hit, no immune system, immunity is really low. They, they, you know, when the pandemic hit, they're forced to, the company's forced to close down because they have to close down. And, 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 and it's like, oh, but, but what about my pay? Well, we're, we're gonna have to make people, we're gonna have to um, make redundancies, but they've got nothing in the bank. It's the same pandemic but your but our experience of life is not the event it's mm -hmm. our capacity in relation to the event and the greatest capacity is consciousness so so we have an insurance policy which is our consciousness honest i mean i i'm, I'm not just telling you theory i'll be honest 
I have seen div there's certain devotees, I, one in particular, from early on when he came to the movement, he was reading regularly. Mm -hmm. And if I'm honest, I see his consciousness and how it is now, and I see it's, ex it's in a much different place to many of these peers who, you know, they read every now and then, you know, you know I mean, they're all chanting. But, you know, some of them, they read here, here every now and then. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's optional. They didn't take it so seriously. But because he took it seriously, point A, and because he made it a habit, which is very powerful, point B, subtly, without anyone realizing, he's becoming stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And not just stronger, he's becoming more in touch with the super soul in the heart in the form of spiritual intelligence. So when he has different challenges and difficulties, he dealt with them in a much different way. Not only that, actually, now I'm speaking about him, I can see what else he did. Not only did he deal with challenges in a different way to his peers, but by his study of the scripture, the Goswamis say that the study of scripture gives virya and smriti. Virya means drive or determination. Smriti means the ability to hold the meaning of the scriptures within the consciousness. So what I saw by, and I've seen across the board, devotees who regularly study Prabhupada's books, not only do they do better when challenges hit their life, but the potency of Prabhupada's books, it makes an individual so proactive that they, they consciously build a positive experience in their life as opposed to the majority of people, including many devotees, who are always reactive, who are always just drifting, and then something hits them and they're forced to react to something that's, that's suddenly come into their space. It's a, difference, it's a difference between a person who is actively building their health mm -hmm. and someone who suddenly has a bad health, you know, a, a disease, and who is now forced to behave, to change their, their exercise routine in order to recover from an illness. Does that make some sense? Yes. Yeah. So thank you for your question. Thank and you so much, Prabhuji. That was a really nice explanation. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Do we have any more questions or comments, please? So I'm going to encourage you, please, don't think it's just optional. Your spirit, whatever you're experiencing in spiritual life, you can experience much more. The, our spiritual life, uh, Krishna consciousness is unlimited, but it's a question of taking full advantage. If you take a small advantage, you'll get something. If you take full advantage, you'll get something completely different. I was on a call just before, just before I came to give class. And it was a call and, and it's about, they were talking about business. And they were talking about how they, they were, they, uh, I'll share with you the, the example they gave because it's a great example. So you have, you have two options. Someone comes, your manager, uh, no, so someone gives you two options. They say you could either have one, one penny or let's say one cent, depending on where you are, right? So one penny, right? And what that one penny will do is it will double in its value every day over a month period, okay? So that's one option. So you can have one penny today, or let's say at the beginning of the month, you can have one penny, but that penny is a magic penny and every day it will double its value. That's one option. Option B is instead of having that one penny, you can have a million pounds. And the question is, which is the correct, which, is, which option would you go for? Now, most people, they would say, okay, I, I can have one penny which, which will double its value every day, or I can have a million pounds. Most people would say, I'm gonna take the million pounds. Wrong answer. Actually, it's better to take the one penny that will double in its value every day. Because if you take that one penny that doubles in its value every day, then first day, you only have one penny. Second day, you have two pennies plus the one penny originally, okay? And then third day, you have four, pen, um, four pennies, so the two's doubled into four plus what you had the previous day. Now, if you take that, if you look at that, then over 31 days, after 31 days, you have over 5 million pounds. But what's happening is it's building exponentially. 
So you're, you're doing one thing and that one thing is building on something else. And then the two things are building on something else. And then the four things are building on something else. So the growth, it starts growing in a seemingly slow way, but then it starts to grow very, very large towards the end. And Krishna consciousness is like that. So for example, you chant, yeah. But if you read and chant, then the reading purifies your consciousness and strengthens your intelligence. Because your intelligence is stronger, your chanting is more focused. Because your chanting is more focused, you get even more benefit from your chanting. Now, you're chanting with more focus and you're reading. So because you're chanting with more focus and you're reading, your heart becomes even more purified. Because your heart's more purified, now when you chant and, and you read, it's even more delicious, it's even more blissful. And because it's more blissful, you like chanting and reading more. Because you like chanting and reading more, you, you make progress even faster. So the speed of progress, it starts slow, but over time, the speed of your advancement goes up, up, up so fast. It's like you're driving a car and the car, it starts slowly, but over time it gets faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. It's growing exponentially. It's not growing in a linear way. You're building on your, on something is building on something else. It builds on something else. It's incredible. So all the different limbs of bhakti, all the different ninefold process, hearing, chanting, etc., they all reinforce, support, strengthen, and amplify. They amplify each other. So we want to encourage you. Take it's not just a question of practicing Krishna consciousness. We want to encourage you take full advantage of Krishna consciousness. Because if you take full advantage, Paradoxically, your spiritual life in many senses actually becomes easier. I'll, I'll give you one point. In this purport that we were just reading, it talks about Lord um, Brahma being the Raja Guna avatar, Lord Vishnu being the Sattva Guna avatar, and Lord Shiva being the Tamil Guna avatar. It is so amazing. I, I, I almost mentioned this today so, to someone. If you know about the modes, you can consciously choose which mode you want to live in. And you can guarantee that by living in a certain mode, you can guarantee a certain kind of outcome will come into your life. No? In any area, in any area. And you can predict what's going to happen to someone, right? Someone chooses a job and they made their choice about what, what they were going to do in the mode of passion. So it looks wonderful in the beginning. But the mode of passion, Krishna says, begins like nectar, ends like poison. So you know, yes, in the beginning, it will look wonderful because it's just um, they made a choice in the mode of passion. It will look wonderful in the beginning. In the long term, they'll be frustrated and also a bit annoyed, right, or angry. You could see someone else. They make a choice in the mode of ignorance. It's bad in the beginning, and it will continue to be bad. You can see someone else. They made a choice in the mode of goodness. You can see because it's in the mode of goodness, Krishna says it begins like poison. It's a bit more work in the beginning. But in the long term, the results will be incredible. You see? And, and, and so you can use the teaching practically. It's not a theory. It's not, yeah, yeah, Prabhupada says, yeah, yeah, nice philosophy, and then I've got to be practical. It's not like that at all. The books are full of life-changing knowledge, insight, wisdom. What to speak of the fact that it helps you to get in touch with the super soul, right? Huh? who can give you even more because the teaching and the guidance of the super soul is unlimited. In first canto, chapter 19, text number 12 in the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada says every major decision should be confirmed by some authority. Isn't that amazing? But how many devotees do you know who do that? Most times we make major decisions, we don't even check with other people, but the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says when you make major decisions, always confirm them. Because if you speak to someone who's your friend, who's your well-wisher and who likes you and who also has knowledge, then you can say, I'm thinking about doing this. And you can get their feedback and they can say, you know what, I, I'm not sure. Did you consider this angle? Or did you consider this option? So, oh, you know what, I never thought about that. Oh, okay, now, now yeah, I, I completely forgot about that. And then you take it on board and you make an even better decision. Life and destiny is coming from decisions. Our life now is based upon previous decisions. 
material decisions and spiritual decisions. So if we follow the map, the spiritual map of the Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, if we just try, Krishna will help us. And you'll have an exponentially better sense of spiritual life, a better, an expo exponential enlightenment and exponential ecstasy. Okay. So maybe we'll stop there, unless there are any more questions. Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. That was wonderful. Uh, I thank again uh, for this class today. Thank you. So if no one has any questions, comments, realizations, then with your permission, Prabhuji, we can end the call here. Thank you for allowing us to be of some service for you. Please, please pray for us so we can, we can properly um, serve and please our spiritual masters and Srila Prabhupada to, uh, and to their full content, please. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you so much. Hare Krishna, thank you. Hare Krishna, thank you. Hare Krishna, Prabhu, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Buddha Baba and Prabhu. It was very Thank special. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming. Thank you, devotees. I will end the call. Hare Krishna.